look today, we want to take a look at companies that are trying to move into the platform of Windows 10 throughout their environment. Windows 10 offers a lot of great features from Microsoft. We're going to look specifically at the performance and security issues inside of Windows 10. So what keeps companies from moving from Windows 10? Well, they have a lot of devices. And if we take a look at the chart, we notice that Windows 7 still comprises about half of the desktops in the world today. Windows 8 still holding on. Windows XP is out there mostly for home users. And if we also look, we see Windows 10 has risen to 22.59%. Now, keep in mind that this adoption to Windows 10 is mostly in the home market. Why is that? Simply because when you go to Best Buy today, once Microsoft announced Windows 10, your OEM providers, whether that's Dell, HP, and IBM, started shipping those desktops pre-configured with Windows 10. So that's why the market share is that high. But if we look in the corporate world, most of them are still running at Windows 7, and quite recently, honestly, most of them probably just finished a migration from XP into Windows 7, which was very time-consuming and very costly. So what happens after that? If we look at the architecture from Windows 7 and Windows 8, we still notice that while quite a few of them, a little bit over 54%, are using the 64-bit version of the Windows operating system, a huge percentage of that, 46%, are still running at 32-bit OS. What does that really mean? Well, 64-bit operating system, without getting too technical, is simply faster operating system. It can leverage more of the memory and more of the horsepower of the actual hardware platform, where the 32-bit version is very limited. As an example, if you purchased a new laptop in the last few years, most likely it is capable of 64-bit architecture, and it probably even came with more than 4 gigs of memory, more probably like 8 or 16 if you're a power user. However, if you're in that 46% percentile, you're actually only using 4 gigs of the memory because 32-bit operating systems can only use that address space. The rest of the memory chips you might as well pull out and use as a coaster because they're useless to you. So it's very difficult. With these things in mind, the performance and security, why is the adoption for 64-bit not going as quick as it is? And we're going to take a look at that today. And understand also that these percentages here, we're talking billions of devices. So your customers are looking to make this move into Windows 10. And we look at something in that 46% when they're trying to move over to Windows 10 and 64-bit operating system. We're literally talking billions of client devices. So let's take a look at the reason why it's difficult to move over to the 64-bit operating system. Well, if you're trying to migrate today, whether you have Windows 8 or Windows 7 to Windows 10, <coughs> and you currently are running 32-bit, you can do an in-place upgrade, you can do a re-image, and most likely your status is going to be just fine. You're able to do that. However, if you're running a 32-bit version and you want to go to the 64-bit version of Windows 10, Unfortunately, that's not an easy process to do, and most likely you're going to end up with a broken operating system. There is no upgrade path. simply means you have to simply reinstall your system. The other thing we want to talk about is UFI, which is the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface, which is developed by Intel. Moving from BIOS to UFEI is actually not something that you can do. There is no upgrade path to it, regardless of operating system. The only way to move from UEFI to UEFI is, regardless of operating system, if the system you're trying to re-image or upgrade is already in UEFI mode. So the next question that would beg to you probably answering is, what is the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface? Well, I'm glad you asked. Basically, I'm not going to read everything on this screen. You can certainly Google this information to learn more about it, but there are a couple key points we want to talk about. First of all, this was developed by Intel. It was not a Microsoft standard. Microsoft is simply leveraging the UEFI technologies inside of Windows 8 and, more importantly, Windows 10 to enhance performance and security. But there are over 140 technology companies that contribute to this consortium that leads to the basics of the guidance of how uh, UEFI is, is put out there today. A couple of the things that you need to understand is that master boot record from the old BIOS days it goes away and is a new formatting technique. This leads into mass performance on your operating system at boot up times, sleep times, and so forth. It's like I'm working with a VM. They boot up very, very quickly, and they're able to take advantage of more than just that 16-bit processor mode and one memory address space that BIOS has been limiting us with for over 50 years. And it does have to change how your hard disk is laid out. We'll talk a little bit more about the security side of this as well. 
Since Windows 8, Microsoft has started using Secure Boot. This is also prevalent in 8.1 and Windows 10. Basically, in a nutshell, what this means is that it is only going to allow signed loader files loaded during the pre-installation of Windows or the pre-booting of the Windows operating system or any operating system for that matter. It also can work with the trusted platform module, which most hardware devices have today. Again, the whole point of this is making it much, much more secure. Your smartphones have been doing this since day one. For example, if you ever heard the terms rooted or jailbroken, depending if you have an Android or uh, Apple op, uh, mobile phone, basically move, means as the device is powered on, it goes through a series of steps that each step trusts the other step, making sure there's no bad code in there, nothing goes wrong. That's what UEFI is starting to do with your PC desktop and server operating systems. It's ensuring the security of the machines. So some of the benefits, simply the master boot record no longer exists. It certainly can support drives well over the limitation that normal MVRs exist today. Incredibly faster booting up power and sleep time, so it's a great benefit to your end users. Efficient power system management, much more reliability, simply because of how UEFI works and making sure that root kits can no longer exist inside. And more specifically, when we talk about Windows 10, a lot of the Windows 10 security features, because of the cyber attacks that have been going on in recent years, all built from the ground up have to have UEFI turned on to turn them on, such as secure boot, device guard, measured boot, and so forth. All of these features, which you can certainly read more about on the Microsoft site, can only be activated if you switch your hardware to UEFI booting. So I'll give you a quick idea of what that might look like. In the legacy BIOS world, when you would power on a machine and maybe hit F2 or escape to get into the BIOS, we've seen for years that rootkits can exist here. Basically, it's malware. It's viruses. Your virus uh, detection system, once the operating system might detect it, try to clean up what's going on, you reboot your box, and it comes right back. Why? Well, because it exists down at that lower level. It exists in a master boot record. Class 1 was the first implementation as hardware vendors tried to slowly start adopting UEFI and come up with the standards. Class 2 is where they inter interacted with the CSM module. But really it's where Class 3 exists. And if you notice on these slides, that little gremlin guy cannot exist in the UA UEFI OS. So those existing rootkits, those existing malware things can no longer exist in this state. Now as time goes on, we I'm sure we'll see people starting to attack UEFI. But just understand that, as with all security tools, it's always a leapfrogging effect. You come up with a new standard, a new security tool that you put in place, you're basically shielding yourself from existing issues, but I'm sure new issues will come up. But rest assured that in the future, the new security features from the booting process will all be based on UEFI. So you certainly want to start moving into this realm. So let's take a look. All these things sound great. We want to run a faster server. We want to make sure our systems are on 64-bit. Software packages are slowly moving that way where they're no longer even run on a 32-bit OS. We know it's faster and more secure. Why don't companies start adopting this? Well, let's take a look at that. The issues to moving to 64-bit or even UEFI when you're talking more than just your home computer is, is your bar BIOS and hardware compatible. Again, any machine in the last eight or 10 years should be, but when you're talking tens of thousands of computers, you need to have that information at your fingertips. What is your existing OS? As we explained before, if you're running a 32-bit system, I have no upgrade path to move in a re-imaging process straight to 64-bit. I have to wipe the machine. Does your vendor support it? And if you do want to do all these things, I got to capture that user state. I got to move it into the new system. What about all the software installed, all the configuration on the devices? These are the issues that we have. So again, we want to be able to capture that user state, his favorites, his home directory, all those cool things. All the different software that's installed on that machine, we need to make sure it's on the newly re-imaged machine when we're done this process. Because remember, to do this, to move from 32-bit to 64-bit, or to enable UEFI, it is basically erasing your hard drive and starting over. So this is a very tedious and labor-intensive task, especially when you're talking hundreds to thousands of PCs that you have to do this on. So how do we help you with this? Well, at Champion, we work with Big Fix, an IBM product for endpoint management. And while a lot of these features are out of the box in Big Fix, we've went ahead and added some extra features for analysis and reporting so that you could see 
current state of your environment. What systems are basically in UEFI type mode? What are using secure boot? What is taking advantage of all those features that Windows offers you today? We're looking at your hardware, your BIOS, your memory, your disk space. What systems can move to Windows 10? What systems can actually operate in this 64-bit environment? So we have that information at your fingertips. So again, we have to find what systems are ready to go. We have to identify any hardware issues that you might have to address. <coughs> Basically understanding your entire current status. We can report on the progress during this migration phase and again leverage this data as the next version of Windows comes out because of course the new operating systems will constantly be coming out and refreshing themselves. <coughs> so the first step in this is what do we do? Well basically we need to find the machines that cannot move to 64-bit operating system that cannot move to UEFI boot. There are all those legacy boxes out there. That's step one that we have to do, and your environment is filtering that out. Now, I only have three icons, or four icons up here, but you can imagine each one of those could re represent 10, 1,000, or 10,000 machines apiece. You can see why dip, how this is difficult. But again, leveraging Big Fix, we're able to capture this data in real time and get these reports and data analysis and have them at our fingertips and start leveraging and filtering our devices that can move. So again, one of the first things we do once we eliminate the machines that can't do this is we do an inventory of all the software and configuration and hardware on the machines. This is a built-in feature of Big Fix, and this reports up to the inventory module inside of Big Fix. So again, Big Fix out of the box. It'll find all installed software. It knows the host name, configuration issues of a box. It knows its serial number. What we did at Champion is we wrote some custom content to trim the company-specific packages. What does that mean? For any particular machine out there, it's going to Big Fix will record all of the software, .NET, PowerShell, all these things. Well, when we move over to Windows 10, a bulk load of that is going to be replaced by the Windows 10 operating system. Really what we're looking for is that company-specific software. Is Adobe on there? Is Office on there? Is any custom packages on there? So we limit that scope of view. We create an XML file for this information, also with the host name and the serial number of the devices itself. And more importantly, we leverage this data and have it queryable by newly imaged machines. And we're going to see why that's important in a few minutes. Step two of our process, once we have the inventory completed, and we now filtered our machines that are capable of moving to 64-bit and UEFI, and we have a complete inventory of these devices, we're now ready to work with these machines and actually move them or start the process of moving them to 64-bit UEFI enabled Windows 10. Well, how do we do that? Well, remember, we talked about that user state. Somewhere on the network, we need to copy off the user state for all these devices that we plan to migrate off to a network share so that they can be restored at a later date. Again, Big Fix offers this out of the box. It leverages the Microsoft user state tool, which is provided by Microsoft, supported by Microsoft to do user migrations. It also captures the host name. What do we have to do at Champion? Well, in a large organization, we realize that where you're storing your user state data in a dispersed network will be in different locations. So we made it location specific or location aware. We also added the ability to add custom um, XML files to that user state capture if you used the tool before to ensure that we get all the data that you want to capture during that user state. We added a whole workflow to this to make it automated, and we also let you interact with the end user. Again, it's important as an end user, if I start the process of imaging your box and capturing your user state, I kind of don't want you to make many changes at this point in time. So we need to interact with your end users to let them know what's going on. Once we have the captured user state, we again have the machines that come back. We've already filtered down what's ready. We inventoried and we know we have captured user state on these machines. Our next step is we have to wipe them, enable UEFI, and install the new operating system. Well, how do we do that? We send a command down in our workflow to these devices and tell them to boot off a Pixie server, or in the case of Big Fix, called the bare metal server. It inventories the machine, understands what profile, and it sends that WIM file to the box. In the end result, well, here's the steps that we do is we now will have a new machine running, switched to UEFI mode, running a blank Windows 10. Again, out of the box, Big Fix gives you this bare metal capability. It also gives you the re-imaging capability. But re-imaging alone will not let us move to UEFI or switch from 32-bit to 64-bit. So what we were able to do at Champion with some IBM uh, support help was be able to detect and know what vendor the machine is at, 
what commands are needed to run to switch it to UEFI mode, we make that switch, we reboot the machine again against the Pixie or network boot server, rerun that profile. Now he knows he's in UEFI mode and allows the Windows 10 operating system to be deployed, also installing the Big Fix agent. So again, we have a complete OS uh, environment installed. We re-added the endpoint to the big fix environment, but we continue our workflow because at this point, I now have a blank slate machine. It does not know its configuration, does not know what its host name was, it has no idea what software was on it and so forth. It's a blank uh, endpoint in our environment, but we have control of it with the big fix agent. So we have to go to the next phase. In the next phase, we look at our new blank system. Well. At this point, we want to restore software, the configuration, the host name, the user state. We need to bring this back to where it was in its prior operating system's configuration. How do we do that? Well, remember that we had that inventory file? Well, within Big Fix, we're able to send that information back down to this machine, and all the configuration, its host name, software can get reinstalled. And any software that was not on it before simply does not get applied. So now we have a machine that's almost back to where it needs to be. It has the software, configuration, host name, and so forth ready to go. However, we didn't join it to the domain yet, and what else didn't we do? Well, we didn't restore its user state. Because we are able to capture its host name and location, we're able to find the correct place to restore its user state. Once that's done, we'll actually restore it into your Active Directory domain into the OU structure it should belong to. So again, Big Fix has some of these capabilities out of the box. What we've done at Champion to modify some of these is be able to work that into our UEF workflow and 64-bit upgrade workflow. So we have to inventory the machine. We have to restore all the package software. We have to change the configuration and host name back. We have to restore the user state from the exact user state that we took off of it prior to the upgrade. And again, our last step is actually to join the domain. We do a bunch of other things during that process as well, but these are the high-level ones that we do. And this will help you move forward into your work. So again, leave BIOS where it belongs in the past. You really do want to move to UEFI and 64-bit OS operating systems on the hardware platforms that can support it. It no longer uses the master boot record. You're going to have incredibly fast boot-up times. It's going to be a much more secure system. Manually doing this over time for people that have just got over the Windows 7 migration, the average cost, even with using tools, was approximately $425 because there were so many manual steps in there, very labor-intensive, and actually, depending on the size of your environment, could take six to seven months or, or actually even years, depending on the size. We're trying to automate that process. We're trying to make this a much simpler adoption into the Windows 10 and take advantage of all the uh, features out of Windows 10, whether that's security or performance. And also, using this process and investment, be ready for what comes after Windows 10 and beyond. For Windows 10 specifically, remember to take advantage of those security issues, whether that's secure boot, credential guard, device guard, all of those great features, you have to have UEFI enabled on your system. So with that, I say thank you.